Well, our speaker tonight uh, is Dr. Mary Habeck, who lectures on Al-Qaeda and ISIS, as well as military strategy and history, Johns Hopkins, Zeiss, Georgetown University, American University. Her recent monograph for the Heritage Foundation has the title of uh, the subject on which she'll be speaking tonight, the US must identify jihadi Salafists through their ideology, practices, and methodology, and isolate them. I encourage you, you can go to the Heritage Foundation website and get uh, Mary's excellent monograph. Now, I first encountered her renowned name when she wasn't quite as famous as she is now. Uh, when she first published her book, Knowing the Enemy, Jihadist Ideology and the War on Terror, and you're having sequels to those? Yeah, I actually have one of them finished. One of them is finished, yeah. great. Uh, would that be Attacking America, Al-Qaeda's Grand Strategy? It is. Terrific. <laughs> um, Dr. Habeck has taught American and European military history in Yale's history department. I mentioned that she has also taught at uh, Zeiss here in Washington. Her PhD in history is from Yale, as is her master's in international relations. Between 2008 and 2009, Dr. Habeck was the special advisor for strategic planning on the National Security Council staff. As a former armor officer, I'm particularly attracted by the title of one of your books, Storm of Steel, the Development of Armor Doctrine, <laughs> Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Habeck. Tonight, what I'm hoping to do is to give you um, an additional way for understanding the problems that we're confronting in the Middle East and um, elsewhere in the world. Um, a, a huge problem that did not start with 9-11, but that was um, pretty uh, sharply brought to our attention uh, by the events of 9-11. Um, I was um, a professor at Yale University at that point, uh, teaching military history, military and strategic history. And I had, um, however, spent the two years before 9-11 um, learning about Islam, ordinary Islam, not the extremists at all. And when uh, the attack occurred, um, I immediately started reading everything I could get my hands on about the extremists in order to understand the people who had carried out that horrific attack. And what I learned was that for uh, many of my colleagues, um, the problem was not one out there, the problem was, in fact, one with America. Immediately after 9-11, there was a teach-in held at Yale University in which the brightest minds in the history and political science departments and, and the law department concluded that the problem that we were having um, uh, and the horrific events of 9-11 had been caused by America's foreign policy. And that what had to change was our relationship with the world, that we in some ways deserved what had happened. I had, however, been reading about ordinary Islam, as I mentioned, during the 1990s, and I recognized the language that was being used uh, by the attackers. And I understood the sorts of tropes, the appeals that they were making uh, with this language. So I started to read very closely uh, the sources for their ideology. And what I discovered was uh, that we were dealing with a death cult, a cult that has um, somewhere around 0.0167% of the Muslim world behind them, but one that is convinced that they can take over the entire religion and convince other Muslims to follow them. And if they won't follow them willingly, they'll do it, uh, be forced to do it through violence. So we've seen some of that in the Middle East. Every once in a while we hear stories about ISIS carrying out horrific attacks or massacres. Most of what we focus on is attacks against Americans or our allies. We focus on attacks 
against Christians or the persecuted or the Yazidis or others. Uh, but in fact, the vast majority of the people being killed by the extremists are other Muslims. The vast majority. Uh, in terrorist attacks, it's nine times as many Muslims are killed in terrorist attacks as non-Muslims. And when it comes to irregular warfare or insurgency in places like Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, it's almost enter entirely uh, Muslims that are in fact being killed in pursuit of their goals. So I, right from the start, understood the language as being used in the religious fervor that underlay a lot of the actions that were being carried out. And when I had conversations with my colleagues, however, um, religion was dismissed as an explanatory principle for what was going on. People preferred to talk about politics, about social issues, about a lot of other things, rather than talk about the religious language or even the religious belief that might be behind some of these actions. Um, at the same time, I found that there was another developing opinion in America that what we were confronting was, in fact, all of Islam. That the problem wasn't some small group, but that Islam itself had a serious problem. One that went back thousands of years, and one that had been animating the religion from the very start. I looked into it. I spent a lot of time studying that. And what I found is that Islam itself went through a tremendous transformation, real reformation, in the 19th and early 20th century. A reformation from which it emerged a very different religion than what it had gone into, uh, what it had begun in the mid-19th century and previously. But this is not the first time this has occurred. In fact, Islam has gone through multiple reformations. Um, about every 500 years, it goes through a tremendous transformation. And I became convinced that we were dealing with something other than just Islam with these extremists. So I felt as if I were caught between two sort of arguing groups, one of which was convinced it had nothing to do with religion, and one of which was convinced it had to do with all of the religion. And I disagreed with both of them profoundly. So tonight, I'm going to offer you the evidence <coughs> to help you make up your own minds. And perhaps you'll find yourself, like me, someplace in the middle. Um, and um, by the way, having things thrown at you from both sides. A, I, I'm a, a fairly conservative person. I uh, spent 18 years at Yale and didn't lose my conservative principles. I, I, um, I blame it on my mother's uh, Scotch-Irish stubborn, stubbornness, right? This is, this is where you get that from. Um, but um, at the same time, um, writing my book was the first time in my life I'd ever been called a, a liberal, <laughs> um, a progressive, by some people um, from the conservative side. A, on the other hand, I've had a lot of people on the progressive or liberal side who've spent a lot of time throwing things, uh, sticks and stones at me uh, for even daring to raise the fact that something about religion might be involved uh, with the groups that we're talking about. So let me start. And what I'm going to do, I hope for you, is provide you with some evidence, some facts, and some interpretive frameworks for looking at these facts and making up your own mind about what is going on um, in the Muslim world. So the first thing that strikes me is that knowing the enemy is still something we're all struggling with. Understanding what motivates these guys, why they're carrying out these attacks, and by the way, what kind of group we're actually, you know, what are their ultimate aims, what are their uh, ultimate goals, how are they going about doing it? I had conversations with people from the very start in which they would say things like, but they don't really have a plan. They just, they have an objective. They want to, you know, create the perfect Islamic state, a state they call the caliphate, but they don't really have a strategy for doing it. They're just kind of carrying out random attacks and killing people and hoping somehow um, a state will develop out of this. Um, and I also realized that we're having trouble defining what this enemy has to do uh, with Islam. 
Um, some people are convinced it's all of Islam that's the problem we're dealing with. Some people are convinced it has nothing to do with Islam. Um, uh, by the way, there have got a lot of groups out there that call themselves Al-Qaeda and a lot of groups that say they're associated with ISIS that say they're somehow linked together. Are all these groups the same thing? Are all jihadist groups exactly the same? Do we have to take them all equally seriously? Are Islamist groups a problem as well? Should we take them just as seriously as we do the jihadist groups, the guys who are carrying out violence to achieve an end? Well, the other guys, some of these Islamist groups have the same objective. Uh, they're just using different means. Shouldn't we take them just as seriously? Um, and by the way, um, if I asked you guys to describe the extremists, wouldn't the first word you'd use to describe them be terrorists, right? I think a lot of us have uh, grown accustomed to calling them terrorists. I'm going to make an argument that they're not terrorists at all, uh, that they are, in fact, insurgents, which is a far bigger problem uh, than simple terrorism. So all these questions that I raise here in these three separate parts is, uh, are, have really important policy implications. If we decide it's all of Islam that's the problem, you got 1.8 billion people that might be the enemy, right? Uh, on the other hand, if it has nothing to do with Islam, then we might completely misread who the enemy is likely to be recruiting and how they're likely to go about doing it, right? Um, if we decide, uh, really, uh, all those fighting groups out there that call themselves Al-Qaeda, the, the only thing that's really important is keeping ourselves safe. There's a lot of people who think that today. They think, oh, you know, let the Middle East burn. They're just killing each other. I hear people say these things, right? We don't need to be concerned about it, except if they decide to attack us. But we might keep ourselves safe and lose the entire rest of the world. And by the way, if we misread what kind of enemy we're dealing with, we might suppress the enemy in one place. We walk away. The instant we walk away, they come back. And we've seen it happen, I don't know, a dozen times in a dozen different countries. How many times have uh, people gone into Somalia trying to help fix Somalia? Um, I mean, besides the Kenyans, the Ethiopians, and Amazon, right? The United States has been there as well. Uh, we walked in and out of uh, Iraq, and the problems simply come back. We've walked in and out of a lot of countries, and the problem seems to come back every time you just walk away. It's not just us, as I'm going to point out in just a bit here. So there are all sorts of things that we need to understand when we're talking about knowing the enemy. We have to understand them ideologically slash religiously. We have to understand them organizationally, what they really are, what, what actually constitutes these groups. Is everything equally a problem? And we have to understand them as fighting groups. What are we really dealing with when we talk about um, these groups and their desire for violence? What kind of violence? And what is their strategies? What are they hoping to really achieve? So I'm not going to probably be able to talk in depth about all of these uh, during the 45 minutes <laughs> or, or hour <laughs> that I have. Uh, to talk. But what I'm hoping to do, as I said, is to pro provide you with some frameworks, some evidence and some frameworks for you to be able to look at these problems and make up your own mind about them. So first of all is ideologies. Islam, as I said, 1.8 billion people. Um, in the 1990s, that was my original interest, was just ordinary Islam. Not the extremists, not Islamism, not jihadism, just Islam. I felt it was going to be something that was going to be important in the future. So in the 1990s, I spent two years um, doing basically master's and PhD reading and research in order to get smart on an issue I knew nothing about. And what I discovered was a world. It's, it's so big. It's so diverse. And so the Sunni-Shia split, uh, split that everybody knows about is just one piece of how big a world we're, we're discussing. Um, there's all sorts of, of different groups you're talking about. You've got modernists, you've got traditionalists, you've got people who are very pious and serious about the religion, and people for whom it's really a cultural thing, and they you know, sort of take it as a kind of label that you use or something that defines the, the holidays you, you um, decide to celebrate and, and not much else, right? 
Um, but there are these groups that call themselves Islamism and Salafism. Those are two separate things. They're sometimes conflated. People sometimes talk about them as if they're the same thing, but they're really not. Islamism is actually a response to European colonialism. And it started in the 19th century. It was about, we have to fix our uh, religion because we have been conquered by Europeans. And they might have uh, some ideas we can borrow, or maybe we should reject them. And there's this huge argument within uh, the, the groups that later became the Islamists about whether you could actually learn from uh, the infidels or whether you had to reject it completely and go back to the pure religion of Muhammad. On the other hand, the Salafis, um, that's what used to be called Wahhabism. Uh, that wasn't the result of uh, European interactions at all. It had uh, everything to do with Ibn Abdul Wahhab's conviction uh, that the religion itself had been corrupted internally by the actions of other Muslims. So uh, both of them came to the same conclusion, though, that you have to purify the religion and you have to return to the way things were done in a specific period. But they chose actually very different periods to focus on. The Islamists talk about going back to the time of Muhammad and the first four followers of Muhammad, his successors, or caliphs. That's what caliph means, successor. And the Rashidun, um, the righteous ones who followed him. And that's what they really prioritized. On the other hand, the Salafis want to go back to the 12th century. They actually don't like the period before then. Uh, the 10th century and before, they criticize it all the time. They don't like it. So the Salafis are actually the ones that we're going to be interested in because they're the ones who gave rise um, eventually to uh, the jihadi Salafists, which is the form of religion that's practiced by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and a lot of other extremists. Um, but what, what is jihadism? Well, this is a modern thing. Jihadi ya, iya at the end, uh, was sort of used during the 20th century and afterward um, to talk about turning something into a political belief or an ideology of some sort. So jihadi ya, jihadism, you know, was really about making jihad the center of the religion, making it all about fighting um, and about the struggle uh, with the infidels. They are a tiny percentage of uh, the Islamist and, of course, the Salafis. I'm going to talk about them in a bit. But even amongst the Islamists, they were less than 1%. So if you take a look at the Muslim Brotherhood in some countries, uh, they believed in some countries in using violence. and In other countries, they didn't. So in Egypt, after 1966, they stopped using violence. Uh, before 1966, they did believe in violence, and they did have a jihadist section, but it was a small section. You know, the vast majority of Muslim Brotherhood weren't involved in violence. Um, after that, you had these small splinter groups. You know, you have um, the Muslim Brotherhood was um, hugely uh, cut down to size by the uh, Egyptian government in 1966, killed off the vast majority of their leadership. And the guys who were left said, we give up. We're not going to use violence anymore. But of course, you always have splinter groups that say, eh, we're the real IRA, right? We're the real Muslim Brotherhood. And they called themselves uh, the Jihad group, the Islamic group, all sorts of names for themselves. And they engaged in violence, but they were a tiny percentage compared to the really big Islamist group. So this is you know, about 1% uh, decided we have to use violence to achieve our aims. We can't do it through some kind of social pressure or through voting or democracy or anything else. You have to use violence in order to achieve your ends. Um, on the other hand, the jihadi Salafists are those few Salafists who went through about three transformations I'm going to talk about in a bit here in order to become uh, something quite different from the Salafism that is practiced in Saudi Arabia today. And everybody calls them jihadi Salafists or Salafi jihadis. It depends on um, who you're talking to. I call them jihadi Salafists or jihadi Salafists. Uh, the difference with them is they're convinced that only their version of Islam is the true and correct one. Nobody has ever practiced that version of Islam ever in the entire history of Islam. I can state that with pretty, um, you know, 100% uh, certainty. Um, they have made it up. They made it up beginning in the 1960s and 70s. 
and it took its final form in 1988. And they've been practicing a form of religion nobody else in the entire world in the history of Islam has ever practiced. And they're imposing it first and foremost on other Muslims, usually forcibly. If you won't do it, um, they'll kill you. So there are a lot of Muslims who are being forced to practice a form of religion uh, that they really would prefer not to, but they don't have much of a choice. That's the jihadi Salafists. And by the way, they have a global concept for their vision as well. The Islamists, by and large, are about nations. They're about Egypt. They're about Turkey. They're about Tunisia. Um, they understand their country is the one that needs salvation, not other countries, whereas the jihadi Salafists have a global vision. They want the whole world. So where did it come from? How can we say that this is a death cult? How can we say that it's 0.0167%? That's pretty specific there. Well, you have to go looking for it, and you have to do a lot of work with uh, reported numbers of people who belong to um, <coughs> violent groups, and then you have to add in for their support base uh, behind them. Um, but those are the numbers you come up with if you just do a look around the world and just add up the numbers. So where did it come from? <coughs> well, it comes from Salafism, uh, which, as I mentioned, is what everybody today calls Wahhabism. It's the same thing. Okay, and, and that comes from a specific place. A guy named uh, Ibn Hanbal, who founded one of the four law um, schools of Islamic law within Sunni Islam, and uh, a specific interpretation by a guy named Ibn Taymiyyah um, in the uh, 13th and 14th centuries. And then the guy who revived him 400 years later, you notice there's a teeny tiny bit of a gap there, <laughs> uh, named Ibn Abdul Wahhab. He basically just revived Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas. And then he um, decided that he was going to implement these on his neighbors and friends in Saudi, what later became Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. And they took to it very kindly. They um, tossed him out. He was forced into exile into the center of the peninsula where he uh, was given refuge by a guy named Ibn Saud. Uh, he married his daughter. The two formed a sort of cohesive bond that has endured to this day. And he convinced Ibn Saud to use violence to impose his vision on people not in the West, but on other Muslims in Saudi Arabia. And in fact, um, this was the difference uh, between uh, the Islamists and the Salafis from the beginning. The Islamists believed we have to use violence, but it's going to be used against the West, you know, jihad against the infidels. Whereas the Salafists uh, believed in using violence against other Muslims, first and foremost. Um, and he managed to uh, seize a big chunk of the peninsula and set up the Saudi state eventually. And then you have um, an intermixture with something rather unexpected, a guy named uh, Said Qutb, who is a Muslim brother who believed in violence. He was a jihadist. Um, he had a specific methodology that he believed was necessary in order to carry out this violence. But he also agreed with the Wahhabis, or the Salafis. He said, other Muslims are to blame for our problems. They've all left real Islam. And if they won't agree to go back to real Islam, we have the right to use violence against them to force them to do what we want. So kind of a meeting of minds when it came to that issue. He also thought, by the way, that um, those people he called the Jewish Crusaders, and that is not a mistranslation. It's not the Jews and the Crusaders. It's the Jewish Crusaders. Um, were the real enemy behind all the evils in the world. So one who had sort of destroyed true Islam, and not led astray, but had convinced other Muslims to follow them. And behind them all, of course, was the Jews. He wrote an entire tract in which he explained how all the ills in the entire world were caused by the Jews. And he made them the main enemy. The Jewish crusaders, then, are those crusaders that are being manipulated, used, puppeteered by the Jews in order to achieve their, end, their aims. So, um, but this is a guy who's in the, you know, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. How in the world did he have any influence on anybody? 
Um, well, basically through his brother, because see, in 1966, you'll notice that date, he was one of the people who was rounded up by the uh, Egyptian government and executed. Uh, but his brother escaped, and he went off to Saudi Arabia, where he was given a professorship at Ibn Abd um, al Aziz University, uh, which was attended by um, Osama bin Laden, who went to his lectures. And he passed on these ideas, and he absorbed and took in also Salafism, and agreed with their concepts, the most extreme of their concepts, and came up with something new, a new form of Salafism called Sahwa Salafism. A Sahwa Salafism argued that you have to obey every single one of the uh, Sunnah or the ways of life of Muhammad, or you're going to go to hell. So it's not enough just to do those five pillars, not enough just to do the best that you can. If you don't do everything that Muhammad did, if you don't imitate him precisely and in a very specific way, you're going to go to hell. So the Sahwa Salafis uh, took Salafism and transformed it. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, influence of Muhammad Qutb. And the result was a new movement within Salafism kind of split between Saudi Salafism and the Sahwa Salafism. A lot of people think the Saudi government's the problem. They're the ones who are supporting. Actually, mostly it has to do with the Sahwa Salafis, who they've had an on-again, off-again relationship with. And a lot of times those people end up in jail, in Saudi jails, as often as they do in the West. Uh, because they were very critical of everybody who didn't follow their version of Islam, including the Saudi government. And uh, the Saudi government didn't take uh, kindly to that and put them in jail. So these um, Sahwa Salafis, though, by and large, believed that they could do things by um, social pressure, uh, by education, and things like that. They didn't talk about <coughs> violence, right? Uh, Muhammad Qutb did sometimes, but uh, he learned to shut up about it. You know, it, it gets you in jail if you say things like that to the Saudi government. Um, and it might have gone nowhere, right? This might have been it. You might have had this movement in Saudi Arabia. It still exists to this day, by the way. And one of the problems we have um, in the United States and elsewhere is that um, Saudi um, mosques that they've set up often, uh, they didn't pay attention to uh, the preachers that were being sent over. And some of them were Sahwa. Um, Salafis rather than Saudi Salafis. Recently they've been cleaning them up, but uh, back in the 90s, plenty of places around the world had Sahwa Salafis that took them over and used them to spread their ideas uh, about Islam. A very specific version of Islam that, by the way, nobody ever had practiced um, up to that point. Nobody. Take my word for it. Now, I can talk about some of the differences in just a bit here between their version of Islam and others. Oh, by the way, you probably have had others explain this to you, but I'm, I just need to say this, especially for um, an audience that I assume is mostly Christian. Um, what generally matters for Christians is orthodoxy, right? Correct belief, right? Uh, what matters for Muslims is orthopraxy, correct practice. The practice of the religion is the religion. So how you wear your beard uh, set, tells uh, everybody who's Muslim what version of the religion you're practicing. How you choose to dress, whether you dress like a Westerner or you dress traditionally, tells people your practice of religion. It's as if, you know, Episcopalians all had to dress and act a specific way, and all Catholics, well, all the different parts of Catholicism had to look and dress <laughs> in different ways. And you could look at them and say, oh, that person belongs to the Sede uh, Conte, I can tell, by the way they're dressed today, you know? That's basically what you get with uh, Islam. And these guys dressed like nobody since the beginning of time. Take my word for it. I'm going to show you pictures. <laughs> so uh, Muhammad Qutb is off there in Saudi Arabia radicalizing people towards this version of Islam. And he's not alone. There's, there's others who are doing it as well. But he's the important one because he came up with some ideas that are going to feed directly into the jihadi selfist vision um, for Islam. And then on came this guy, Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian who was also in exile in Saudi Arabia. And he uh, was hugely influenced by the Afghan Jihad. He said that this um, invasion was not about Afghanistan. 
It was about the entire Muslim community, and he's the guy who invented the concept of foreign fighters, that is, of other Muslims having to go to other countries to protect the inhabitants of a foreign country because we're all Muslim brothers together. He, he basically invented that concept. Up to this point, jihads have been declared by governments, have been declared by caliphates, and so on and so forth, but they'd all been about our country or our area or our caliphate. It hadn't been about the Muslim world as a whole. He, on the other hand, said, no, you have to think of these borders and boundaries put up by the infidels as, in having, as being meaningless. All of us are Muslims together. We all have to protect. And he convinced uh, thousands of um, Muslims, especially in uh, Saudi Arabia, to go off and fight in the Afghan jihad uh, based on that argument. You can tell we're getting very close to jihadi Salafism, can't you? Because <laughs> you, got, you got the, the very uh, fringy Salafi version of Islam, and you've got global jihad going on here. So you have to put those together, and they all come together in bin Laden. Because Osama bin Laden was um, a, inducted into Muhammad Qutb's version of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, when he was in school. And he also brought to it Salafism of very specific sorts, Sahwa Salafism. And uh, the day he graduated from college, he went off to Afghanistan to fight in the jihad. And while he was there, he met Abdullah Azam, became his deputy in his organization, and then basically just took it over after Abdullah Azam's death, and that became um, the base of jihad. That's what al-Qaeda uh, jihad means, the base of jihad. And that's what carried out 9-11, those guys, that group, a few thousand people. That's the only people in the world who believed in their version of Islam at that point. And here's their version of Islam. Oh boy, this is what happens when you go from Macs to PCs, you don't get the build. So here's their basic vision. Following the Sharia as we define it, is essential for human existence. And their version of the Sharia is like nobody else's. I'm going to talk about Sharia in a bit here. And so you, you get a feel for just how fringy uh, their ideas are. And by the way, the entire world's going to follow our versions. We're going to start with other Muslims, um, but eventually we'll force everybody to follow our version. If you won't do it willingly, we'll, we'll force you to do it through violence. Uh, but this is only possible within a state that they called the caliphate. That's right. This is going to be the only state that can actually do this, force everybody to do what we want. So we got to recreate the caliphate to make everybody follow our version of Islam. And by the way, they, like, they literally believe this. We're the only true Muslims. Everybody out there, they have Muslim names. Uh, but they've all been either led astray or gone astray themselves. They're not really Muslim. The entire world, in fact, has gone back to paganism including other Muslims. And we have to enlighten them, we have to wake them up, we have to basically convert them to our version of Islam. Okay, So it's not mostly about us. That was a big thing I discovered when I started looking at what they said. Uh, almost everything they're doing is about other Muslims. It's really not about us. Um, so we're going to carry out a war. But the war is going to be not just about these unbelievers, it's going to be about all these other Muslims and how we're going to force them to follow our version of Islam, first and foremost. And so we're committed to waging what they believe is an eternal war against all these different groups. At uh, one point, um, you know, seven, nine, 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 nine um, billion Muslims, first and foremost. The other seven billion people in the world, secondarily. Uh, they had a problem because they declared war in the entire world. Um, I've actually seen the strategic documents in which they argue about, well, how do we prioritize our enemies so we, you know, so we don't end up having to fight everybody simultaneously? They, they came to some interesting conclusions about it, and I'm going to talk about it a bit here. So how do, we, how do we tell this religion is different from ordinary Islam? Well. There's first of all what they call aqidah, which means ideology, creed, um, our belief system. 
and these about 12, 12, 15 <laughs> points are the, are the things that are the most significant in distinguishing them. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but there's about 15 of them that absolutely distinguish them from every other version of Islam in the world. Uh, but this minhaj is also important. It's uh, how you practice. It's your methodology for practicing religion. As I mentioned, uh, belief is one thing, um, but that's not the important thing. The really important thing is how you practice religion. And they believe in all of these things that make them very, very different from ordinary Muslims. So about 30 different points that distinguish them absolutely from every other version of Islam in the world. Uh, but here are their primary ideological principles, the ones that really set them apart. Something called uh, their version of Tawhid and their vision of what jihad is all about. Uh, their version of the Sharia. Something called Wala Walbera, which leads to Takfir, which you may have heard about. And something uh, you've also probably heard about, Dawa, their version of Dawa. So I'm going to do this really quickly here so that you get a feel for how different they are. So within Islam itself, this is what Tawheed means. This is basically Islam 101, right? There's only one God. You should only worship one God. The end. <laughs> That's basically it. The, the entire creed or statement of faith that you have to say in order to become a Muslim is, I believe there's one God. And Muhammad is his prophet. There you go. <coughs> So that's it. That's Tawheed. All right. This is what Al Qaeda, ISIS, uh, the extremists in general believe. Okay, there's only one God. He has no partners. But that means he only he has the right to be worshipped and obeyed. He's the only one who has something called hakimiya, <coughs> sovereignty. He's the only one who's allowed to make laws, laws that everybody has to follow. So if you don't follow his laws, you're not really following Tawhid. So the vast majority of the Muslim world uh, believes uh, God is merciful and compassionate. I'm doing the best I can here. Um, he'll take care of yeah, everything after I die. I'm hoping for the best. I'm doing everything I can. <laughs> you know, I hope I'll make up for it by doing this. Uh, but you know, you're like, eh, I'm hoping. I've got, I've got my hopes after I die. That's how most Muslims think. These guys are like, no, if you're not actually doing the thousands of things we say you should do, you're going to hell. That's the difference between them and ordinary Muslims when it comes to it. And I'll talk about that more in a bit. But beyond that, if you belong to a state that tries to make your own laws, that is, you believe in democracy, or you believe the people have sovereignty, or like the president, or somebody else has sovereignty other than God alone, uh, then you're not really a Muslim. This is how they uh, get to the point where the jihadi Salafists literally say democracy is a foreign religion because it violates Tawheed, or this vision of Tawheed. All right, now you're probably thinking, okay, I get this. I can see this. It, it makes logical sense, right? So what do other Muslims think about this argument? They go, what? Wait, can you go over this one more time for me? You're saying there's one God. I believe that too. OK, there's one God. And now you're saying democracy is a foreign religion. I don't get the connection between. Could you go over that one more time? Every single statement these guys put out, they have to go over Tawheed in this version again and again and again. Because ordinary Muslims, and I've asked them, don't understand the connection between these two things. It sounds like you can go down a logical train of thought, do A, B, C, D, it all makes perfect sense, right? Uh, but to ordinary Muslims, I'll give you the equivalent. If we had a strange sect in America that said, in order to be a real Christian, you have to believe in three branches of government because of the Trinity. You see, you've got God the Father, that's the president. You've got God the Son, that's the legislature. And you got God the Holy Spirit, that's like the judicial system. You guys would all be like, what? <laughs> Could you show me that in the Bible or in any traditional writings that I accept? You can't find this anywhere. 
It's not in any, any uh, piece of the Quran, the Hadith, in any traditional writing since the beginning of time. The only guy who believed this was Ibn Taymiyyah. And he got thrown in jail for it back in the 13th century. And of course, it was revived by Ibn uh, Abd al-Wahhab. Not quite in this format, but very, very close to this. And then given this current uh, sort of way of thinking about it, uh, about democracy and all that, um, by a guy named Makdisi, who literally wrote the book, um, Democracy is a Foreign Religion. All right, so uh, not accepted by most Muslims. In fact, if you talk about this with them, they're like, I, this makes no sense at all to me. All right, but you can see how this makes you reject democracy. It makes you reject any sort of peaceful solution to your problems, right? Because, no, you have to have uh, something more forceful, not this uh, democratic solution. Uh, what about jihad? Well, um, how many of you have heard two completely contradictory definitions for jihad at some point in the last 15, 20 years? Yeah, okay. Either it's a completely peaceful internal struggle, right? Or all the infidels have to die. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, it's got to be one or the other. It can't be both simultaneously, right? Uh, but in fact, it's, <laughs> it's like um, a Facebook relationship. It's complicated. <laughs> the reason it's complicated is because Islam is whatever Muslims say it is. <clears throat> um, let's see how to put this. So if you come from, let's say, an evangelical background, you uh, look towards uh, the Bible as your main source for the way your religion should be defined. If, on the other hand, you're a Catholic, there's something else called tradition and the collegium, or I'm probably saying it all wrong, of... Magisterium. Thank you, magisterium, that you can also look to. And there's this flexibility, and there's this change. It's got these deep connections. It's not like it's become something completely different, but it's got flexibility to it. This is kind of what's going on with Islam. Um, the religion is what your current consensus of the smartest people in your religion say it is. It could also be what the guy running your country says it is. <laughs> um, or what your particular ethnic group um, traditionally says it is. Or your clan or your tribe. That's, that's what it is. That's what Islam is. In fact, uh, Muhammad himself said, my community will never disagree on an error. So what the community says Islam is, that's what it is. And for about 70 years, uh, from the late 19th century right, right up until sometime in the 1970s, uh, there was an agreement that uh, the modernist interpretations of Islam were the right ones. The vast majority of uh, Muslims agree. Either the traditional way I practice it in my village, or this modernist interpretation that's practiced in the big cities and in the universities and so on. That's, that's what Islam is. Um, what's happening is these guys are attempting to force a new consensus, their consensus, their vision of what the religion, and to co-opt the entire religion, force everybody into this box. That's what they're attempting to do. But when it comes to jihad, you can see the evolution over time, uh, during the life of Muhammad himself. Um, it started off, uh, jihad means struggle, as I'm sure you guys all know. It doesn't mean, there's perfectly good words for fighting, for killing, for war that could have been used, but they're not used. And the first 13 years of his life, he consistently used jihad to talk about struggling to understand God, struggling to follow God, to do God's will, those sorts of things. That's how we use it for 13 years. Then he was persecuted, went on his hijra or migration to a neighboring um, city, and he began to get revelations that the jihad, the struggle now was to defend yourself. You've been persecuted, 
you're allowed to defend yourself. That sounds like defensive war to us. Um, and then there were revelations that you're allowed to take that struggle, that fighting in God's path, to take the religion back to your hometown. And that sounds like offensive war to us, right? And at the very end of his life, uh, he said to his followers, we're returning, he said after his last battle, from uh, the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And his followers said, what do you mean by the greater jihad they got? He was obviously referring to fighting with the lesser jihad stuff. And he said, the greater jihad is the dr uh, struggle to control your own desires, to follow God, and to create a just society. Depends on which version of the hadith you, know, you read, which one of those is given emphasis. Mm -hmm. All right, so for most Muslims, there's something like a circle going on. It started off as something peaceful, became about defensive fighting, then became about offensive fighting, and at the end of his life, it went back to some kind of internal struggle. Um, but uh, during the 12th and 13th century, you had a codification of jihad as fighting, and hardly any of this internal struggle remained except amongst the Sufis. And the Sufis maintained this right up through the 19th century when the vast majority of the Muslim world decided to agree to change the definition again. And jihad became about an internal struggle. That's really what it became. Uh, but it was also <coughs> defensive war. If you're attacked, God has said you can defend yourself. So if you ask any of your Muslim friends, they're going to give you that consensus. It developed in the late 19th, early 20th century. Jihad is about an internal struggle, or if we're attacked, we're allowed to defend ourselves. It was really only the Islamists who said, no, we have to go back to the Rashidun. Well, here's the funny thing about the Rashidun. It's very different uh, if you look at the, the vision of jihad back then than developed during the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, by the way, Al-Qaeda goes back to the 12th and 13th centuries. They don't go back to 900 or any place close to it. And what, how do they get away with that? Well, they say that whole uh, saying by Muhammad that there is this greater jihad and lesser jihad was made up by the Sufis because they're a bunch of cowards and they don't like to fight. So you could just toss all that out, which, by the way, upon which is predicated a whole bunch of Islamic law. You just toss that out, and you're left with nothing but fighting, which is where things were in the 12th and 13th centuries. So they basically want to go back to an earlier consensus about jihad. And all the texts they cite are from that period. They don't cite things later. They don't cite things earlier. Everything is from that specific period when it comes to jihad. That's it. Everybody else you know, got it wrong, apparently. In the 12th century, you got it, 12th, 13th centuries, you got it right. And that's all you're supposed to listen to. And uh, jihad is fighting and fighting alone. And it's a matter for you as an individual to decide. It's not up to the, uh, the state to declare these jihads. We're going to declare one. But where'd they get the right to do that? They just made it up, by the way. That's no, no school of Islamic law ever said that was an OK thing to do. Uh, what about the Sharia? Oh, boy. This is like the hot topic, right? Everybody's talking. This was my original interest. I was interested in jurisprudence back in the, uh, the 1990s. So the first thing I did was go looking for the books of Sharia. Right? Uh, my image was that there's a room someplace, and there's like 100 books. And it's like, you know, you got the legal Sharia code 101, <laughs> and you could pull down, and it would say uh, Sharia 100.1.1. Thou shalt not murder, and if you do, here's the penalties. Isn't that kind of how, didn't, isn't that how you think of the Sharia, right? Something like that? Um, maybe, maybe something like the Bab Babylonian Talmud also, mixed in a little bit, right? With this one source, though, you can go to, and you just sort of take it down. There you go, the books of Sharia. Boy, was I wrong. There's no books of Sharia. Uh, so let's start with what you know. You can say is following the Sharia is the religion because orthopraxy is the right way forward, and the Sharia means the pathway. It is the pathway God has given us to go from this earth to paradise. 
and you follow the sunnah of Muhammad in order to get from where you're at to paradise and to avoid hell. So the Sharia means the pathway, the correct path, the straight path is another way uh, to talk about it, right? Um, but most um, you know, Muslims, when they think about it, think it's a lot of things. And in fact, there are thousands of versions of the Sharia. Now, there's what you might call the Ten Commandments that everybody agrees is part of the Sharia. Um, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't commit adultery. Um, there's about ten. Uh, but um, even things like you should cut somebody's hand off for stealing things is argued about vociferously. And uh, in fact, the entire concept of the Had punishments uh, was criticized heavily in the late 19th, early 20th century. And a new consensus developed, and in fact, they probably didn't exist. Uh, which, of course, the SMS threw out and said, of course they exist, yeah, because everybody agreed on them in the 12th century, so <laughs> guess what? Um, so it means many things, and there's tons of different variations. Basically, it's how our community understands uh, practicing a religion. And this leads to some interesting um, contradictions. When people go from their community to another community where the religion is practiced differently, you could sometimes have some alien, feelings of alienation, like the way you're doing it, okay, it's good for you, but it's not good for me. This is how we've always understood. But there's only one Sharia. There can be only one pathway. How can there be lots of different interpretations? Of well, about a thousand years ago, they said, they agreed to you, your pathway, your interpretation of the pathway, and to me, my interpretation of the pathway. Uh, because they had been getting into fights over it. But about a thousand years ago, they were just like, okay, there's lots of different pathways. You practice it the way you, your intentions are what matter. Your intentions are what matter. You intend to do God's will, you're intending. And where do you get this Sharia from? Well, you get it from the Quran and the Hadith, right? The Quran, uh, the revealed word of God. And the hadith, the reported sayings about or by Muhammad about how to practice religion. That's how you, you do it. But it's, it's your interpretation of it that matters. There's no one accepted interpretation of these things. There's thousands of them. Um, all those Islamists who say, no, there's just one Sharia and it's ours. No, they're making that up. It, it really, no. And these guys are the ones who are the worst, obviously, because their version of the Sharia is um, so different from everybody else's that when they impose it on people, they have, there's revolts. They have demonstrations against it. That's what happened in northern Mali. When they showed up and imposed their vision. There were, there were demonstrations against these guys, which they met by, by shooting everybody who showed up for the demonstration. Right? So that's how they deal with it. You're going to follow our version. The people in northern Mali had never practiced anything like this. The people in Somalia, their version of Islam was nothing like what was imposed on them by the Shabaab, which is Al-Qaeda, which is um, the jihadi Salafists. Let me give you a, a great example of what this does in this war we're fighting. How many of you in 2007 read about Somali taxi drivers in Minnesota demanding that people who ride in their taxis are not allowed to have alcohol or dogs or women by themselves. And there's this huge debate, right, about Islam. Or Bibles. Or Bibles or all sorts of things. There was all sorts of debate about can we <coughs> coexist with Islam? If this is what the Sharia looks like, can we exist, coexist with Islam? What nobody asked was the, the question I asked myself when I heard this, which is, why in the world are a bunch of Somalis practicing jihadi Salafism? Because the version of Islam that's practiced by and large, no, not by and large, always among Somalis is nothing like that. Nothing. They're, they're, it's a Sufi, very Sufi-influenced religion. There's a lot of dance. There's a lot of 
uh, women don't cover up like they do amongst the jihadi Salafists. It's nothing like their form of the religion. So why were a bunch of Somalis acting like Al Qaeda? Was the question I had, and we soon found out when they all went off and joined Shabab. They were being radicalized. Mm -hmm. Instead of talking about Islam, we should have said, why are a bunch of Muslims suddenly acting like uh, jihadi Salafists? So. Uh, this also explains one of the biggest problems they have with other Muslims. I have to put it like this because it doesn't really have a good translation in English. It means something like friendship, allegiance, alliance, something like that. And means disavow. I have nothing to do with you. All right? I reject you entirely. Hatred and enmity. Okay? Um, they believe in only having friendship, only uh, being with others who agree completely with their version of the Sharia. And rejecting everybody, even if it's your own parents, who disagree with you. This is why I call them a cult. The first thing a cult does is try to separate you from your community, from your parents, from anybody who might talk you out of it. And that's the first thing they do. They tell you you have to disavow the entire world, including your parents, if they won't follow you. So the Tsarnaev brothers, when they got radicalized, the first thing they did was impose this version of the Sharia on their parents, on their mom and their sister. They forced their mom and sister to act this way. If their parents or their mom had rejected this, this would tell them you have to leave them, physically separate yourself from them because you're not allowed to be around the infidels, which includes any Muslim who doesn't do what we want. So this is what leads to takfir. Takfir means calling a Muslim a kefir or a um, infidel. So it says quite clearly in one of the hadith, the most famous hadith by Muhammad, that if you call a Muslim, another Muslim, an infidel, one of you is going to hell. So the implication is, don't do it. This is how other Muslims take this. You don't do it. Don't call other Muslims uh, infidels. And they don't believe that. They have taken it upon themselves, arrogated the privilege of declaring anybody who doesn't follow their version of Islam to be a bunch of infidels. And back in the 12th century, 12th and 13th century, that meant you were allowed to kill people, take all their property, they were divorced, their kids couldn't inherit. All sorts of things happened if you had the state declare takfir on you. It's, we, we usually say excommunication, right? Um, of course, you'll be surprised to hear then the late 19th, early 20th century, um, during this new consensus that built in, in the vast majority of the Muslim world, that, that went away. It's coming back because the Islamists are winning arguments with people about this, argue, about this issue. Okay, so they're doing that right now, and this is the thing that makes them the most threatening to other Muslims, because this is why you're allowed to kill other Muslims, because they're not really Muslims anymore. They've left the religion. This is why a lot of um, leaders in the Middle East call them takfiris, uh, to point out what's really going on uh, with this whole bunch of people. Uh, by the way, not, not accepted by ordinary Muslims. It's not, it's not in the Quran. It's not in the Hadith. Wala, wal bera, nowhere. It was made up in 1979 by a guy named Qatani, uh, who was a Sahwa Salafi, whose uh, thesis within which he uh, promulgated this idea was overseen by Muhammad Qutb. And then we get to Dawah. Okay, so for most Muslims, Dawah is about preaching, trying to win over other uh, non-Muslims to the religion. And it can be as uh, simple as uh, people watch what I'm doing and then they ask me questions and I tell them what I'm doing and invite them to the religion, right? Or you can have uh, special Da'is who go to other countries in order to preach, right? And you give your charity sometimes to your mosque, because uh, one of the five pillars is you must give a percentage of your wealth um, to, uh, back to God. And sometimes you're giving your charity to Da'is, who you presume are someplace off in 
Africa or Asia someplace, or possibly in America, um, spreading the good word, right? If only they knew what the extremists think about this, because first and foremost, they think Dawa is about converting other Muslims to their version of the religion. Uh, we call it radicalization, right? They think of it as Dawa. You're recruiting them to your version, which includes the idea that you have to be fighting alongside us. And so in some of these mosques that have been taken over by the radicals, that money is going to convince, <laughs> instead of going to Dawa someplace else, is being used to convert other Muslims to their version of, this, of the religion. So I'm going to give you some pictures. And again, this build is bad. I can tell because of the, uh, the problem we're having with uh, Macs versus PCs. So Islamists, Salafists, Nasafwa Salafis, and Jihadi Salafis. These are the significant differences between them, and especially in terms of the war that we're fighting. In every point, even the Sahwa Salafis, you can see that they agree that you have to use nonviolent means in order to achieve your ends. In the case of the Islamists, you're talking about persuasion. You're talking about um, social work. This is how the Muslim Brotherhood became uh, such a, a huge organization in Egypt. They did a lot of social work amongst the very poorest people in places like Cairo and won people over to their cause and their vision of the religion. Um, I say their Sharia, by the way, is moderate in the sense that they don't believe in imposing their views. You are not being forced to do what we want. That's one. And two, they don't care which version of the religion you follow. You've got your ideas. We've got ours. That's OK. Just be pious about your practice of religion. On the other hand, the Salafists have a Hanbali Sharia. Right from the start, they focus just on this version as being the only true and correct one. And for the Sahwa Salafis, a practice that nobody else in the world uh, does either. So the top, of, um, let me give you, you know, just through pictures what this looks like. Uh, this is Mursi, who most people recognize as being a pretty radical guy, right? Uh, but how is he actually dressing or presenting himself? Western. Yeah, he's presenting himself as Western. His beard is, is uh, shortish. His hair is kind of however he felt like putting it up today. And he's got his watch on his left wrist, which is going to be significant in just a bit here. And the Salafists, uh, the Saudi Salafists, are best represented by the guys on top. How are they dressed? Yeah, some, some of them are dressed traditionally, but one guy has a Western jacket over the top of his traditional outfit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got these two young guys on the end who are wearing um, pants and T-shirts, right? Mm -hmm. And if you could see their beards, they've got the little tiny, what do you think of as a Saudi beard, you know? The goatee, mm -hmm. right? The little tiny mm -hmm. one. It's kind of an imitation of the way that the, um, the king, uh, whose name is not king, his title is not king, by the way. Uh, but the leader of Saudi Arabia uh, wears his, right? That's basically what you have. Um, those are what I call, what I call Saudi Salafists. Right. On the other hand, look at this uh, bottom group. These are the Sahwa Salafis that won office during the Egyptian elections in 20, uh, before 2013. Okay? So the Sahwa Salafis, how are they presenting themselves? It's kind of hard to see. I'm sorry. It's a little blurry. Tradition. Very traditional, but they have really long beards. Uh -huh. yeah. Notice? Uh, they also don't have mustaches. They look sort of Amish. <laughs> and they have very short hair on top. <clears throat> right? And you can't see it. But none of them would ever wear uh, a watch on their left wrist. It's, it's one of those things they've interpolated from uh, Muhammad talking about the uncleanness of your left hand. So never wear a watch on your wrist. And if you could see their ankles, they'd be showing their ankles. Because Muhammad said wearing long robes is a sign of arrogance. 
So you shouldn't wear long robes that trail on the ground. They have interpret that to mean you have to at least show your ankles. So if you could see them, they would be showing their ankles. They, and you have to dress exactly like this. You are not allowed, if you're a Sahwa Salafi as a man, to look any differently than this. Okay? So that's a really specific version. Any Muslim looking at this could tell you right away, oh yeah, there's a bunch of Sahwa Salafis, you know, <laughs> because they're so easy to identify. It's kind of like how you could tell that's, that, that person's Amish, right? Of course, you might have trouble because there's probably there's like a 20 different Amish sects being able to tell the difference between <coughs> each one of them. Um, I grew up an hour away from Amish country in Ohio where all the dissidents from the big community in Lancaster went. So there's like 20 different communities there. And they all dress their own way. They all behave in very specific ways. Like, I did not realize mowers were a bone of contention. Whether you have a push mower, or a, an electric mower, or a gas-powered mower, or one you can ride, actually determines the difference between different sects. That's what we're talking about here. That's how specific this is. Any Muslim looking at that would be able to tell you, oh yeah, those are sock with selfies. These guys are even uh, more specific, right? That's the jihadi selfists. And you can see the differences in each one of those points I raised there. It's about violence. It's about imposing their views, and their version of the Sharia is it. This is it. And we're going to force everybody in the world to do whatever we want. Um, but how are they presenting themselves? Well, the, the picture is not so easy to see, but uh, they look like an army, don't they? Mm -hmm. Right? And more specifically, if you could see it, they'd, you'd say they were a squad because they've each got different weapons. And. Um, in the picture, you could see their ankles. So a Muslim looking at them says they're Sakwa Salafis, but they're jihadi Salafis because they believe in using violence to achieve their ends. Okay? They're so, not restricted to one country, are they? Well, this is very strange. You raise this, right? Because uh, these guys are, this is uh, Shabbat. This is image. I, I could have shown you pictures of them all, but yeah, El Shabbat. This is the Shabbat in. Uh, East Africa. But these guys are actually dressed in a shalwar kameez, which is from Afghanistan. Or Pakistan. Afghanistan, Pakistan. So actually, when, and by the way, they're wearing a uniform, aren't they? Right? So um, the way you interpret this is they are actually um, members of a foreign army. That's what they're saying, of a global army, of one that is not from Ethiopia or Somalia or any place in East Africa. It actually has its headquarters someplace else. That's what they're telling people. Okay, so the bottom line, I'm hoping I've convinced you we're not confronting all of Islam, but, but it came from Islam and it wants to take over the entire religion. It would love to co-opt the entire religion. You gotta distinguish these guys because otherwise we'll end up alienating a lot of people who could be our allies. The people who are on the front line now are not the United States or our allies. The people on the front line are other Muslims. And we've gotta be able to recognize it when we see it. And we'll be able to tell where we're actually dealing with this problem because the first thing they do is force everybody to follow their version of the Sharia. So before you even know anything else about the country, you can say, you know, you don't have any other signs of extremism. When they are forcing other people to act the way that they want them to, they're not doing it because they've been won over by an argument. They're doing it because somebody's got a gun to their head and is telling them you're gonna do it or die. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I have more to say. Mary, we're just, we're running a little late, but if you have time for a couple of questions. Absolutely. Could you wait for the microphone, please, and speak directly? Yeah.
can you hear? Uh, yeah. Professor, thank you very much. I appreciate this. This was uh, very interesting. Are you familiar with the debate that uh, Robert Spencer had with Professor Creek in New Hampshire about 10 years ago? The hmm. topic was the only good Muslim is a bad Muslim. Yeah, I, um, actually, I don't know this, no. Well, the, 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 uh, the side Spencer took was that there are lots of good Muslims who are not violent, but those are the ones who haven't read the text. And the other side was defending that no, these are in fact good Muslims. Aren't these Al Qaeda and extremists that you talk about really going back and reading their original texts and acting acting much more like Muhammad than most Muslims have over here? No. So a, 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 so let's go back to um, I'm, I'm going to give you some concrete examples of what um, of why I say no. Um, how many of you know that there are uh, Shia living in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, there's a fairly large population there. According to Al Qaeda, they should all be dead. Okay. In fact, ISIS has been spending a lot of time killing Shia, and Al Qaeda has exactly the same ideology. Um, so that's Salafism, right? No, that's Sahwa Salafism. It turns out the Salafis were perfectly fine with the Shia living in their own country. Um, doesn't that violate real Sunni Islam? Well, it depends on who gets to define real Sunni Islam. Um, all of the uh, you know, Sunni Muslim countries and uh, Iran uh, are signatories on international uh, mm -hmm. law when it comes to the laws of war. And by the way, uh, the laws of the United Nation. Does that violate Islam? It depends on who gets to control Islam, who gets to tell you what Islam is. Well, the very first thing that happened to Islam in the 900s, uh, one of the first things, it's about 150 years after Muhammad's death, was they ran into uh, Greek philosophy. And they incorporated Greek philosophy directly into Islam itself. The very first version of, Islam, of Islam, in fact, was a, a sort of hybrid of Greek philosophy and Islam as it was practiced by the Rashidun. Was that heresy? When the entire community agrees on it, no. Um, the Sunnis themselves will argue, because they believe the majority rules, that if the whole community agrees on something, it is the truth. My community cannot be led astray, Muhammad said. And they, they believe that. So as I said, Islam is what mu uh, Muslims say it is. And um, by the way, all this stuff about jihad, if you go back and look at the collections of hadith, the very first collection is the Muatta. Uh, there's like five hadith on jihad and zero on a state or how to run a state. There's nothing about how to run a state or that there should be a state. That's the very first collection of hadith. The later collections of hadith begin to develop that, but it's almost always from the Rashidun and what the Rashidun did, not what Muhammad did. Because there's actually very little about how to run a state or what a state should even look like or where you even get a caliph from in the Hadith, let alone in the Quran. The Quran says nothing about it. So to me, it's about interpretation and who gets to interpret the religion. Wow. Well, so to that point, um, I Can you talk about the trend line of where right. this uh, jihadist <coughs> uh, persuasion or conversion is actually going? Yeah. They're going to kill anybody who dissents yeah. at some point. Who's going to be left in the community to come up with consensus? Yeah. And, uh, and where you see that's going? So I'm going to I'm going to go through this really super quick to get to. The very, very end here. Ooh. Sorry about this. No, that's fine. We enjoy the maps. <laughs> <laughs> it helped us see what's happening. 
So, so I mentioned that the consensus developed in the late 19th, early 20th century was basically modernist. Um, there were the Islamists. There was a split between, it, it's called reformist Islam because they, everybody wanted to reform the religion uh, in order to deal with the challenges that were presented uh, by Western ideas and by the conquest of your countries by Europeans. Uh, but your, your argument was about how you go about confronting this challenge. And some people said the West has a lot to teach us and we can adapt and adopt their ideas. And others said, no, we have to go back to the original Islam and practice it more assiduously. We're being rejected by God because we're not practicing the religion correctly. And that's the original split between what later became modernist and Islamist. And the modernists, though, won out. And they won out for about 70, 75 years. But they created nothing but failed states. And the argument they were making for this version of Islam uh, began to look you know, pretty thin if you have no job, your leadership is all corrupt, uh, you got a bunch of people like Gaddafi or you, know, you name it in charge of your country. And if your name doesn't happen to end in Mubarak, you know, you're never gonna go anywhere in that country. Uh, and people began to listen to the arguments made by the Islamists. And they said, well, you know, maybe they're right. We gave the modernists a chance and look what they created. So if you look at every single state in the Middle East, they were created on modernist grounds. Doesn't matter which one you look at. Um, you know, from Iran, Indonesia, all the way back and forth, all of them were modernists, except for, of course, Saudi Arabia. But the rest of them, they all tried this, this vision of Islam and this vision of society, and it, it apparently all failed. So here's choice number two. Here's door number two is the Islamist or the Salafis, one or the other. And a lot of people are giving tries. So the trend line is towards more, obviously, more Islamism. And you can see this in the public square and how women are dressing in a lot of different things. Um, the push for laws that are more like the 12th century and things like that. But when it comes to the jihadi Salafists, they're really not winning people over to their cause. What they're doing is they're using murder and intimidation to force people into their, their ranks. I'm afraid yeah. we're, we're, we have to let the staff go home, but Mary, thank you very much. Thank you, ladies.